think um, none of you have, have heard before from other politicians, so I'm excited. So without further ado, Mr. Andrew Yang. Notice stores closing around where you live here. I mean, yeah, you've seen it, right? 30% of American malls are going to close in the next four years, and a similar number of Main Street stores. Now, working in a retail establishment is the most common job in the U.S. 8.8 million retail workers. The average retail worker is a 39-year-old woman with a high school degree making $11 to $12 an hour. So the question is, what are those workers going to do when the malls close and the Main Street stores close? My friends in Silicon Valley are working on trucks that can drive themselves. And uh, they, they tell me they're 95% of the way there. That we're five to 10 years away from robot trucks taking the roads. Now, I was talking to someone who's a truck driver, Joshua. Where's Joshua at? So Joshua's a truck driver. And Joshua's seen the same videos. Maybe he doesn't know all, all of this, this stuff about uh, what my friends are working on in Silicon Valley. Yeah, so you've seen the videos. We've all seen the videos. And you've seen the trucks. Wow, that's unusual. This, this tru <laughs> those trucks aren't that commonplace yet, but they will be. And the reason that they're going to be commonplace is that the financial rewards for automating away Joshua's job uh, are $168 billion per year in not just labor costs, but fuel efficiency, equipment utilization, fewer accidents. And so that's what my friends in Silicon Valley are gunning for. They're saying, hey, $168 billion a year, that's one of the biggest pots of gold in American business. On the flip side, there are three and a half million truck drivers like Joshua around the country. It's the most common job in 29 states. Think about that. There are three and a half million truckers, average age 49, 94% men, average education, high school or one year of college. And so what are the truck drivers going to do when the trucks start driving themselves? How many of you saw the recent Google AI demo of this of AI making a, a call and making appointments for someone? What do you all think? Go ahead and shout it out. How long do you think it's going to be before AI can do the job of an average call center worker? Already doing it. Yeah. Already doing it. Yeah. Already happening. Yeah, pretty much it's technically possible right now. And there are two and a half million call center workers in the United States making $14 an hour. So you can see that there's this massive transition we're in the midst of. The reason why Donald Trump is our president is that we are in the third inning of the greatest economic and technological transformation in the history of the world. The third inning has brought us Donald Trump. And just project forward, what's inning number four, five, six going to look like? This is the fundamental issue, the fundamental set of problems. And so I woke up to this. Before running for president, I started an organization called Venture for America. So I, I've been an entrepreneur. My last company was acquired in 2009 by a public company. And I was very sad about what was going on in the country back then. This is a financial crisis. We're all like, what the heck just happened? And so I quit my job and started an organization called Venture for America. I donated 120000 of my own to see the organization. I started calling wealthy friends uh, and saying, do you love America? And 
then the savvy among them said, what's the meaning if I say yes to that question? And I said, at least $10,000. And then they're going to say, OK, here's $10,000 worth of loan. So we started with a budget of $250,000, and it grew and grew to uh, $6.5 million or so, uh, thousands of applicants, hundreds of fellows, helped create 3,000 jobs around the country in 18 cities. There was a documentary made about my organization that's now on Netflix. How many of you like documentaries? Raise your hand on that. I, this was a documentary crowd. I knew that. I knew all the hands were going to go on. Uh, so there's a documentary on Netflix right now called Generation Startup about my organization helping entrepreneurs in Detroit. Uh, it has an Oscar-winning director. It's a great, great movie because it's like entrepreneurs. So that's what I've done for the last seven years. And so I was working with these entrepreneurs, but I had this sinking feeling that I was pouring water into a bathtub that hasn't gone. Yeah, he doesn't like Trump either. Uh, but I was pouring water into a bathtub that has a giant hole ripped in the bottom. And this giant hole is being torn by AI and advancing technology that is just going to pick up steam. So imagine if you were an entrepreneur, your, your job was to create jobs, you realize that what you're doing is not going to work. Donald Trump becomes president, and then you think, oh my gosh, like the problems are much bigger, nastier, deeper than I'd ever imagined. What are we going to do? So I then wrote a book called The War on Normal People. I have all these facts and figures where it's all laid out what's going to happen. And then I started going to my friends in Washington, D.C. and said, hey guys, what are we going to do? Like the reason Donald Trump's our president is that we're in the third inning of the biggest economic and technological transformation in the history of the world. And what do you think that lawmakers and policymakers said to me when I asked them, what are we going to do? Don't worry about it. Profit. Profit. <laughs> like, find a way to make money on this. The three big answers I got from policymakers, many Democrats included, were, we cannot talk about that. We should study that further. Or, we must educate and retrain Americans for the jobs of the future which is the most competent sounding one. It makes you sound sort of smart and reasonable like you care. And then I said, hey guys, I looked at the independent studies of how effective government-sponsored retraining programs are. You all want to guess how effective government-sponsored retraining programs are? Zero. On a percentage basis? He said zero. Zero is actually more or less the truth. It's, it's the zero to 15% effectiveness rate according to independent studies, and fewer than 10% of workers qualify anyway. It's not like when a mall closes, there's a, like a ring of government employees being like, we're going to train you for a new job. I mean, that doesn't actually happen in real life. It's more or less politician bullshit. And so when I was going to people being like, hey, guys, here's the problem. And I just got back from that. I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, are we really this screwed? Are we really so backward as a country, certainly as a government, that we are unable to even acknowledge the forces that are tearing our society apart, much less do something about it? <laughs> Joshua just said yes. Actually, reflect on that question for a moment, and then say yes if you think that's where we are. Yeah, that is where we are, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's where we are. We are just that backward. And if you watch cable news for about 10 minutes, it hits you like a hammer. You're like, they're just talking about nonsense all the time. Now, if you look into what I'm saying, and again, I wrote a book on this that, that uh, we have copies of, but Bain says the same thing. MIT says the same thing. McKinsey says the same thing. And in another era, like Stephen Hawking, Sam Altman, Elon Musk, like everyone is saying the same thing, but our government completely ignores it. It's wild. When you start digging into it, you're like, what is going on? And so then I started thinking, okay, how are we going to help get America through this epic transformation? And what it requires, it requires reimagining our economy in significant ways. And I realized that there was no way to make that happen unless someone were to run for president and win on this set of ideas. So the first big change we have to make is universal basic income. Now raise your hand if you know a lot about universal basic income. Probably some of you do. Um, so universal basic income is a policy where everyone in a society gets a certain amount of money, free and clear, no questions asked, you get your basic needs, start a business, do whatever you want. And my plan dividend is for every American adult to receive $1,000 a month, free and clear, no questions asked, to do whatever you want. Now the reason it's called the freedom dividend is that it tests much better with the word freedom in it than if you call it universal basic income. <laughs> but the freedom dividend on a family level, and I'm a parent, I have two young children, it improves mental health, graduation rates, it even affects children's personalities. It would create millions of new jobs.
jobs would be the greatest catalyst to entrepreneurship and creativity we've ever seen. It brings domestic violence down. It brings hospital visits down. 57% of Americans right now can af cannot afford an unexpected $500 bill. So think about what that means week to week, month to month. Studies have shown that if you have a mindset of scarcity, which is what you have if you are worried about your bills every month, it's the equivalent of decreasing your IQ by 13 points. That's one standard deviation. So if you have a sense, a creeping sense, that America is getting dumber and nastier, that is because it is. And the reason it's getting dumber and nastier is because people are being pushed into this mindset of scarcity that is making it so that their bandwidth is getting consumed by this week-to-week, month-to-month race against the clock. So if you reverse that, the way to reverse that is by putting $1,000 a month into people's hands. And then they would end up getting their hands up and have a mindset of abundance instead of a mindset of scarcity. Because fundamentally, right now, scarcity is winning in this country, and that's what we need to stop and change and reverse that. So that's number one, the freedom dividend, universal basic income of $1,000 a month. Number two is that we have to get health care off the backs of families and businesses. Because right now, we're living in a health care system that's in the worst of all possible worlds, where we spend twice as much as other countries to worse results. It makes it, how many of you have either not changed jobs or not taken a job or not started a business because you're worried about your health care? Anyone here? I've not, I, I have definitely tried to figure out health care like, because um, I, you know, again, I have kids, so even when I was running for president, I had to talk to my wife about it. I was like, hey, babe, I'm running for president. She's like, what are we going to do about health care? <laughs> it's a true story. So we have to get health care off the backs of American families and businesses as quickly as we can. And the best way to do that is to move towards a Medicare for all single payer system where health care would get negotiated, the cost would get negotiated down to pay for by the government. And anyone who says we don't have the money to do that is not paying any attention because we're spending 18% of GDP on health care. It's coming out of our pockets. It's coming out of businesses' pockets. We just need to take that money and then uh, pay it out of the government. It's going to make things much, much better. And the third thing is that we have to start evolving in terms of how we measure economic value. Uh, so this is how many of you are studying economics in college? I did. All right. So uh, how many of you wake up excited about GDP? Or <laughs> So GDP is something we invented during the Great Depression almost 100 years ago to, because the, the economy was going south in the Great Depression. The government was like, what are we going to do? We need a number for this. And so they got this guy named Simon Kuznets, and he came with GDP. And then Simon was a really smart guy. And he said, OK, here's GDP, but a few caveats. He said, we should never use this as a measurement for national well-being because it would be really terrible for that. Think about that for a second. Number two, he said, we should include parenthood and motherhood in the calculation because it's super important. Of course, ignore that. And the third thing he said is that we should not include any national defense spending in GDP because it doesn't actually drive the economy. So ignore those three things, and now we're riding GDP off a cliff because right now GDP is going up, and everyone's like, oh, GDP is going up. That's cool. Um, and at the same time, our life expectancy is going down. Eight Americans are dying of opiates every hour. Suicide rates are at sky highs. Mobility rates are Remember, student debt is super high, and like, like colleges aren't affordable. So all of the measurements in the economy that would actually correspond to how we're doing um, are doing terribly, and then we're just worshiping this GDP number that, again, we made up almost 100 years ago. So now we have to start measuring our economy in ways that would actually matter to us. Things like mental health and freedom from substance abuse, how our kids are doing, how affordable things are, how many of us are doing work that we actually enjoy. Believe it or not, we're sophisticated enough where we can measure economy in those ways, and then we, we could reward individuals, entrepreneurs, and businesses that move us in those directions. So those are the three big moves. I've got 70 other policy proposals on my website, yang2020.com, which I encourage you all to check out. But the three big ones are the Freedom Dividend, Medicare for All, and then we need to measure what matters. We need to evolve to an economy that focuses on human beings, what I call the trickle-up economy. You guys have heard of the trickle-down bullshit that they sell, and which we know does not work. So the trickle-up economy is from human beings and families and communities up. We are the owners and shareholders of the richest, most advanced society in the history of the world, and we can easily vote ourselves a dividend and start measuring the economy in ways that matter to us. So uh, I'm going to close with a conversation I had again in D.C. when I was going through 
all of these facts and figures with, with a bunch of officials. And one of them said to me, he said, Andrew, you're in the wrong town. This town is not a town of leaders. This is a town of laggards and followers. Like, we, we will be the last people to figure this out. And I took that to heart. I was like, oh my gosh, he's right. They're never going to figure this out. And the way that we're going to wake them up, the only way we can wake them up is to create a wave in other parts of the country, in places like this, like the in progressive, uh, in, like groups of progressive, smart, moral people that can see where we're going, and then create a wave that then starts in Iowa and New Hampshire and goes around the rest of the country and then wakes up the people in D.C. Because we need to do, we need to do the opposite of what we're doing right now in many respects. And the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes numbers. <laughs> so I, I would love your help in making this wave possible. And really, thank you all for having me. And uh, I'd love to take some questions.